you, ladies. Thank you very much. Um, and of course, our Lord God is the great faithful one. Um, and we're going to talk today also about our faith. So that was one of the reasons I just chose that. But he is the faithful, perfect one. Um, a couple quick announcements, and I'm going to just let you look on the screen. Giving. We ask that you give back to BSF because we give to this host church, and we also send money to headquarters. Um, they've hired a lot of extra technical people as we're trying to work all the issues out with our BSF, um, mybsf.com and .org, I'm sorry. Um, so your money is put to good value, and every, every dollar is well spent. Um, also, we have a seminar coming up. And it's personal quiet time seminar, and it will be on February 9th. And it'll be probably a little shorter than maybe even 45 minutes, but it'll be during the lecture time. And it'll be just in the room down the hallway here. Why would you want to come to personal quiet time? Well, we've seen even recently how even Jesus, the perfect God man, how he even had to get away and have a t quiet time a time to reflect, a time to get his heart one with his Lord Father. So it's to equip and to inspire you to meet with God daily through personal Bible study. And so we'll talk about that on the 9th. Okay, um, we're going to go ahead and get started here. I'm going to start just with a quick little story. Um, once there was a girl. And she was watching her mom cook a roast chicken one evening. As the mother was preparing it, the girl asked, Mom, why do you cut the chicken in half before putting it in the oven? Her mother replied, because that's the way my mother always did it. And then she thought, I'm not sure exactly why. Why don't you go and call Grandma? So the girl rung her grandma and asked her, Grandma, why do you cut the chicken in half before you roast it? Well, her grandma quickly replied, that's the only way it fits in my oven. <laughs> so just a little story, but a cute little story. And it makes us question or makes us think, why do we do things the way we do them? And it's also a reminder that we shouldn't just follow or copy others as they may have their own unique reasons for doing them. We should know why. Well, today we're going to start out with that, and we're going to see that we have seen in the previous chapter, 14, we saw that um, Jesus had conflict with his enemies, and we see him teaching his own disciples, and then we see him ministering to the needy multitudes. And as we soak in chapter 15, we're going to see sort of the same thing going on here. And I want you to, throughout when I talk to you today, and as we look at chapter 15, I want you to be thinking what people group you look like most. Or you might fit in a couple of them. Are you a Pharisee? Are you the Canaanite woman? Are you part of the crowd? Are you one of the disciples? Today and every day we have a choice of how we respond to Jesus. And so how do you choose? What does that look like? Let's bow our head in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that this time that we soak in your word, in Matthew 15, I pray that you will speak to us. Please remove me. I pray that the Holy Spirit will fill me now and that it will be your words, the words that are edifying to us and glorifying to you. May we take something away. May it pierce our heart. And may we make a change. May we transform to be more like you. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so you all see the outline already? Very good. <laughs> I see you all writing. So I just divided, just like your Bible probably did. I did the first 20 verses I called the hypocrisy. 
then the next 21 through 28, the healing, and then 29 through 39, the hungry. And we're going to see displayed through all these verses, our key idea here is going to be talking about true faith. We know the Lord is faithful. We just sang, great is thy faithfulness. But we're going to talk about the people now. So in the first 20 verses, we're going to look at how Jesus is going to expose false faith. And then he's going to explain true faith. So is, we are at the point where Jesus is becoming quite famous, actually. And he is having a great influence over many people. And it's grown to the point where these religious leaders are very concerned about him. So what do they do? They get a little delegation. They get a groupie. And these Pharisees and scribes, they, tells us, came to Jesus. Where did they come from? They were in Jerusalem. They came all the way to Galilee, and they're coming to challenge Jesus. From Jerusalem, like I just said, implies that this news of this Galilean prophet and teacher has reached the center of Judaism. And so these men are sent from headquarters, these bigwigs, so to speak, and they travel far. They go about 100 miles and this is a time where traveling is difficult. So this underscores at how determined this group of men were to shut Jesus down. The Pharisees and the scribes did not come to Jesus, because it tells us right there at the beginning how they came to Jesus. But they didn't come to Jesus with affection but instead animosity. They did not come with humble hearts, but instead with a hardened hearts. They came to meet Jesus, but their life attitudes were so negative and fault-finding that all they saw was unwashed hands. They pick the issue of ritual hand washing to confront Jesus. They are, however, looking for just any way to discredit him. They couldn't see Jesus as the greatest movement of redemption that has ever touched our entire world. This is the movement that was cleansing minds and souls and bodies of men throughout the world. Instead, the Pharisees' big eyes, they were opened wide to the little, the marginal, and they were blind to the big. Are you a Pharisee? Well, in verse 2, the Pharisees ask why Jesus' disciples break the tradition of elders not washing their hands before they eat. Their accusation about washing hands has nothing to do with cleanliness or hygiene. They're upset that Jesus and his followers are mingling with outcasts, and they didn't even seek to be purified. The religious leaders were focused, forcing Jesus to deal with the very foundation of their religious faith. Because if Jesus rejected the sacred traditions of the nation, then Jesus was a heretic. So what are these traditions that they so live by? And where do they come from? These traditions were handed down from the teachers of previous generations. These traditions were originally called the oral law that Moses gave to the elders, and they passed them down to the nation. This oral law was finally written down, and it became the Mishnah. Unfortunately, the Mishnah became more important and more authoritative than the original law of Moses. The current religious leaders honored the elders' wisdom by practicing all these additional rules as if they were commands of God. 
Their challenge is so hypocritical that Jesus doesn't even bother to answer it at first. Instead, we read, he fires back a question of his own. And he asks them, why do you break the actual command of God for the sake of tradition? It's kind of like he's saying, uh, you're one to talk. So then he proceeds with an illustration. So let's understand this. This is, he's talking about their practice of Corban. The Hebrew word Corban means a gift. If a Jew wanted to escape some financial responsibilities, he would declare his gifts, his financial possessions, to be Corban, meaning they were a gift to God. And what that allowed is it freed him from other obligations, such as, in his example, caring for his parents. But in doing this, the person was losing the power of God's word in his life and thus hurting his character and missing God's blessing. Jesus illustrates his point in verses 4 through 6 using the example of God's command for children to honor their father and mother. Exodus 20:12 taught a man to honor your father and mother. But the Corbin rule would make a person dishonor his parents and at the same time disobey God. So Jesus then concludes this little illustration, quoting Isaiah 29, 13. He makes it clear here that obedience to tradition made a person disobedient to the word of God and thus prove the tradition to be false. Traditions. Traditions are something external. While God's truth in his word is internal and in the heart. People obey traditions to please men or gain status. But we obey the word of God to please God. Tradition deals with rituals, while God's truth deals with reality. Tradition brings empty words to the lips, but truth penetrates the heart, and it changes lives. So Jesus calls them hypocrites, and he quotes from Isaiah, and he says, These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. So let's look at this. I like this, these, this Isaiah passage. So I, wanna, I wanted to look at that deeper because such deep words here. So that made me ask the question to myself, okay, am I just going through the motions when I even go to church? What is authenticity in God's worship? What makes it authentic and real? What is this experience of worship? What happens? What is the heart like? Is it more than just kneeling and praying and singing and sitting and reciting scripture and eating the Lord's Supper? You can go through those motions, and your heart, though, going through all those motions, can still be far away from God. I don't want to be there. So the drawing of the heart to God means coming alive for our feelings for God. My kids um, recently just attended a Discipleship Now weekend at our church, and I had three of them there, and at separate times, it was very interesting. They all came to me, and they commented. Um, hopefully it wasn't, and it wasn't super negative, but they made the comment that they struggled a little bit with the praise band um, because their remarks while they were singing and worshiping, the praise band almost shamed them 
if they weren't raising their hands in worship. And my, my kids, they, they, they felt that. So what an awesome opportunity. So we talked about how worship needs to be a heart affair and not just going through the motions. So what does that look like? I said, let's be specific. What does that look like? So how are these feelings that we make, that make, I'm sorry, the outward acts of worship, how do we make them authentic? How are they authentic? What are the heart feelings towards God that turn learned forms of worship into genuine worship? Well, the best example always rely on the book. <laughs> the best examples, I think, of extraordinary, rich emotional responses in worship are found in the book of Psalms. So I'm going to let, so I, I just chose a few, and there's many. You could do a whole study on it. So maybe jot a few down. I'm not going to read them all to you. So you, that's your homework. You get to read some of them. <laughs> some of the highest Worship begins with the feeling of brokenness and contrition and grief for sin. This is also mingled with our sense of sin and our longing for his mercy. It's the feeling of fear and awe before the holiness and magnitude of God. Our hearts will well up with the feeling of gratitude hope, and joy. When these feelings are quickened, then the heart is no longer far from God. Worship is no longer than lip service. It's genuine. It's authentic. You don't force this. God wants us to give him our hearts not just our lip service. We believe in the heart. We love from the heart. We sing music and joy from the heart. We obey from the heart. And we give from the heart. So no wonder David prayed, Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. Then Jesus declared boldly to the peoples and multitudes that sin comes from the heart, not from your diet. It is what comes out of the mouth that defiles us, not what goes in. The disciples were worried this teaching offended the Pharisees. So they're running around trying to please the Pharisees. But Jesus, he wasn't worried about the Pharisees. Neither them nor their teachings had been planted by God. And therefore, they won't last. He also even refers to them as blind guides. So he's basically saying, why be afraid of rootless plants that are going to die? Or blind guides that cannot see where they're even going. Peter, he comes up again in verses 15 through 20. Once again, he wants another explanation in, about this food. It's like they don't get it. But guess what? These are Orthodox Jews. This is very different for them. So they are processing. And what does Jesus say? Great question. Are you still so dull? So patiently, Jesus again, he explains it to him again. Whatever enters the mouth eventually goes into the stomach and comes out in human waste. Food never touches the heart. But what comes out of the mouth begins in the heart, and these things defile a person. The Pharisees and scribes were so focused on the externals that they completely bypassed the internal. They needed to see that our greatest need is changed hearts. 
And then Jesus lists many sins here in verse 19. He lists murder, adultery, sexual immorality, stealing, lying, slandering. And all of these things are issues of the heart. Sin. Sin is any word, thought, or action that does not meet the holy standard of God. Since humanity fell with the sin of Adam and Eve, all people are wrecked by sin. No one is exempt from sin. And we all have a natural inclination to sin instead of having a natural inclination to seek or please God. Sin leads people to live for themselves. By nature, we are rebels against God. Sin so pervades people's hearts that without the work of the Holy Spirit to convict and deliver us, we would not even understand the gospel. We would only resist God if we did not have the Holy Spirit instead of fleeing to him. The depth of man's depravity and the pervasiveness of sin makes God's grace and Christ's sacrifice more special. So man's greatest need is not to try to clean his hands or fix his life on the outside. Man's greatest need is a changed heart on the inside. And that's your first truth. True faith is found in a transformed heart. External practices don't achieve internal transformation. So how might you be relying on practices that make you feel more righteous, but you ignore the need for God to change and transform your heart? Where are you allowing a habit, a tradition, society expectations or rights to become more important than the command of God? What are your words and thoughts revealing about the condition of your heart? It is not enough to learn about religion or act religiously or even study the Bible. It's your actions and attitudes. Are they sincere? So are you like these Pharisees? Do those words of the prophet Isaiah describe you? In the next section of verses 21, all the way to the end, actually, Jesus, we're going to see, is ministering in the Gentile territory. He's going to be healing, and he's going to feed a multitude again. Jesus is showing love and compassion as he responds to the Gentile needs. We see full faith in action in this passage. Verse 21 tells us Jesus withdrew from Galilee and a predominantly Jewish territory. So he's been with all his Jew friends. And he's going to go to the district of Tyre and Sidon, a predominantly Gentile territory. This is the only time in Matthew's gospel that Jesus journeyed into Gentile lands. And the person who comes up to him first is a Canaanite woman. Now, the Gentiles were thought of as unclean, and the Jews did not want to be around them. In fact, they even referred to the, to the Gentiles as dogs, which we're going to find out in this little passage. We have that dog reference again. So Jesus here, um, the Canaanite woman has, a, has come to him, and he's trying to remain hidden, but somehow this Canaanite woman heard where he was, and he, she goes to him with a need. Keep in mind that Jesus responded to this woman as he did, not to destroy her faith, but to develop it. And always know 
He knew her heart. And he knows what he's doing. He always does. Okay? <laughs> so her own reply shows that she's growing in faith. She is unwilling to let Jesus go without getting an answer from him. When she first approached him, she called him son of David, which she is definitely putting herself on Jewish ground. And she was a Gentile. This title revealed her faith in Jesus as the Messiah of God, for son of David was the name for Messiah. Jesus knew her heart. Like I said before, he knew her. He kept silent, which though encouraged her to keep asking. When you might feel Jesus silent in your life, do you keep asking? Impatient with her persistent following and crying out, and the disciples are like, send her away. And we don't know here, do the disciples mean, uh, just give her what she wants and get rid of her? Or do they just mean, get rid of her? In either case, they're not showing much kindness, love in action, or compassion for the woman or her demonized daughter. This story, and our story that comes after it, Feeding of the Multitude, it's intended to be a reflection of the reality that Jesus' plan involved much more than Israel and the Jews. His salvation, he is showing them, would spread far beyond Israel. It's going to spread to the ends of the earth. Through Jesus' words and his demeanor, he is teaching his disciples. He's, he's letting them learn that this is a different mindset of the Gentile people, and even in the Gentile territory, showing the disciples the harvest field is ripe. We cannot but admire the patience and persistence of this Gentile mother. She says, Lord, help me. That was her plea. Just help me. She came as a sinner, and she knew she needed help. How do you come to the Lord? What need do you need to bring to Jesus today? Well, in his reply, Jesus did not call her a dog the way the Pharisees and the Jews would have addressed a Gentile. The Greek word here means little pet dog. So it's not the filthy dog running in the streets eating garbage. And the children here is referred to the people of Israel. Well, the Gentile Canaanite mother, she seized on this illustration about the children's bread. And so paraphrasing here in her reply, it is true, she says, that we Gentiles do not sit at the table as children and eat the bread. But even the pet dogs under the table can eat some of the crumbs. What a testimony of faith. It was this great faith that Jesus acknowledges. And immediately he heals her daughter. This woman's faith was great because she persisted in asking and trusting when everything seemed against her. Your second truth is true faith acknowledges sin and the need for a Savior. True faith acknowledges sin and a need for a Savior. Like this Gentile Canaanite mother woman, what unlikely converts has God placed around you? Who do you see as unworthy of Jesus' compassion and mercy. Do I view myself or do you view yourself as more worthy? How will remembering Christ's mercy towards us today change how we interact with those around us? Well, Jesus continues his journey into the Gentile territory in verses 29 through 31. He's in the region of Decapolis, which included 10 cities. 
It says he's healed many, the lame, the blind, the deformed, those unable to speak, and many others. And in the text, it tells us they gave glory to the God of Israel. Jesus was doing the same things in a Gentile territory that he had done among the Jews. And the disciples are taking it all in. They're sort of perplexed. But guess what? Their perspective was being challenged. The feeding of the multitude has reappeared. And only now there are a few differences. We see differences in the number of people, the amount of food, and other miscellaneous details. But it is a repeat of the same miracle. But I did notice that it wasn't the disciples this time who were concerned about the people's hunger. It was Jesus. He saw the need. You can almost picture the disciples asking, well, you think Jesus would perform the same miracle among a Gentile crowd that he had performed already with the Jewish people? Well, Jesus made it clear in this last section that guess what? He came to serve to satisfy and save people from all nations. And that is your last truth. A heart that truly desires to know God will find him. And God's salvation is for everyone who believes. So just like I asked at the beginning, what's your re approach and your response to Jesus? Do you respond to Jesus like the Pharisees with outright hostility and disregard? Are you content to be part of the crowd, just happy to casually observe Jesus, maybe give him some token allegiance, adding him on as part of your life, following him as long as he gives you what you want and attracts your interest? Are you like the Canaanite woman, persistent, coming to Jesus with your needs and with great faith? Or are you like the disciples, learning, and ready to unconditionally follow Jesus despite the cost. So what would you choose today? Heavenly Father, thank you for this time to study your word. May it penetrate our hearts and make a difference. Pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.